The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mark, for that uh, nice introduction. Didn't think it would be that long. But <laughs> Uh, today we're going to present um, like a brief on brief on the uh, ongoing uh, study that we're myself and my colleague um, are currently um, engaging, and um, it is about uh, different methodologies of um, modeling FRP retrofit to um, existing reinforced concrete slabs. Um, the layout of the presentation, we're going to start with a quick introduction, what motivated that kind of study, and then we're going to identify the study parameters that we were limited to. And then we're going to give a brief description of the applied element method. Uh, my colleague um, is representing um, the company ASI, who are actually um, leading that uh, application. And then we're going to show you guys what we got in terms of predicting uh, predicted blast responses using both SDOF and advanced uh, AEM. And we're going to provide some concluding remarks at the end through our study, what we uh, believe that uh, would be the best way to model and what are the drawbacks of using certain techniques. Uh, what initiated that effort is um, a couple of years ago, there was a contest uh, administered by ACI. Um, it was a last blind simulation contest and the whole purpose was to determine what would be the proper material models used for finite element um, <coughs> modeling and also with simplified methods like SDOF that would provide the best prediction uh, measures for uh, pre-testing. Uh, there was a combined effort with the ACI 370 and ACI 447, 447 and it was based on uh, testing program that was done um, at the BLS simulator uh, with the guidance of uh, Professor Ganesh uh, with the um, UMKC. And uh, I was part of that uh, contest and it was has two, two classes of concrete, normal strength concrete and uh, high strength concrete. And the objective was to understand what are the limitations and the capabilities of existing um, modeling techniques. Uh, this is the typical normal strength concrete uh, case, and this is the testing video showing the extent of damage and the cracking. Uh, we're talking 5,400 PSI and regular um, A615 steel. And we're talking about a blast uh, with a shock tube uh, of a 50 PSI with a large um, impulse of about 1,000 PSI milliseconds. Uh, so essentially what we were looking at here with the contest is to determine three parameters. What was the maximum amplitude of deformation? What was the residual displacement? And what was the actual pattern and extents of damage? Uh, through that study, we actually came up with multiple um, estimates that varies from 20% of the actual measurement to 200%. Uh, my case, I, I did well with the CSDOF, but uh, with finite element, it was not that close. And that thing prompted, uh, uh, in, my, in my opinion, um, a need to come up with what would be uh, a solution to reduce the damage for these tested uh, reinforcement pre slabs. Most of them were actually either uh, severe damage or moderate to severe. And the current research work that we're presenting is essentially using different techniques of FRP strengthening to reduce the, uh, the damage extents and to reduce the amplitudes of the um, displacement. Also, we were trying to figure out the difference between different techniques, the simplified SDOF versus the advanced applied element method. And finally, uh, identifying the primary factors that affect the FRP retrofitted uh, reinforced concrete slab responses to blast.
Uh, so the methodology, we're going to use the same testing for the regular concrete for validation of the AEM method. And we're going to then add the different techniques or schemes of FRP and then use both SDOF and AEM and then compare them together and try to come, draw some conclusions about why SDOF um, is good or not good for, for modeling certain cases and how it is. The first case is the control case. It's just normal strength concrete uh, without any retrofit. And we have the last testing data for it. And we have the SDOF and AEM um, simulation for it. And then we started with a regular single layer on the back face, uh, one millimeter or 0.04 inch thick of carbon fiber. And then we have uh, the case three, which is the same case, but with another layer on the uh, loaded face. Case four is going back to the first case two, but with a thicker FR a CFRP. Uh, last case is using GFRP instead of CFRP. Uh, for these cases, uh, these are the properties of the materials. We use a um, standard um, type of FR uh, CFRP and GFRP. Uh, Typho, both of them are uh, five products, and these are the manufacturer provided information for the material strength uh, in terms of the ultimate tensile capacity, rupture strain, and the elastic modulus. Uh, the typical uh, specimen that we used, um, it was a 64 inch total, but supported at a 52 inch at the support uh, uh, faces. And it has nine number three rebars bars at the one on the back face only. And uh, it has a, uh, in the other direction, which is just distributing um, kind of reinforcement, um, another <coughs> five number threes. Um, the material models for, for this uh, were regular, as I said, normal strength concrete of 5,400 PSI, and a, a little bit stronger than normal um, A615, A6 uh, which has almost a uh, static capacity of 72 KSI compared to the 60 KSI. Uh, the blast loading, um, it was an impulsive pattern, and it has a 50 PSI, as I mentioned, and about 1,000 PSI milliseconds impulse. Uh, now we just provide a description of the applied element method, uh, which is the advanced technique that we used. So the uh, applied element method uh, is a modification of uh, the finite element uh, method, you, you can think of it this way. And uh, I'll just quickly introduce the, the main uh, concept. So you're dividing your structure into elements the same as you're doing in finite element, uh, except that the stiffness of the structure is represented using springs along the interface between the elements. So you don't have nodes and full comp compatibility at the nodes. Uh, instead, you have springs along the interface, and those springs uh, are representing the stiffness of uh, the material. Uh, so, so th this is this is basically the the concept. Uh, if you do have reinforcement, uh, then the uh, wherever you have the location of the reinforcement, you can add uh, additional uh, springs for normal and shear to represent the stiffness of that uh, reinforcement. So your uh, springs represent the stiffness for both the uh, L, the concrete and the reinforcement. And uh, the, the main uh, point that I want to uh, point out when comparing the applied element method versus the finite element method is in the applied element uh, methods, uh, the deformations uh, happen uh, along the interface between the two um, between the two elements. So between those two elements, they, they move apart and separate. Uh, while in uh, finite element method, the deformation happens within the element itself based on the shape function that you are assuming for the element. And this way, this, this, the applied element method lends it, uh, allows a quick modeling of separation because every interface is a separation surface that's ready for, for activation. Uh, the other point is uh, the number of nodes uh, used in the applied element are just six degrees of freedom uh, at this one node in the center of the element, whereas in uh, the finite element method, if you're using a solid element, you have at least uh, 
eight nodes and 24 degrees of freedom. So the comparison here is the solution time is at least one to 16 ratio. We've been comparing recently with work in the European Commission. Sometimes the ratio is like one to 30 in the time for uh, solution if everything else is, is equal. So the two main differences is uh, allowing for uh, separation and the uh, efficiency in uh, the numerical solution. <laughs> Other than that, the material model is identical. Uh, you, can, you can choose whatever material model you're using in finite element and use uh, the same uh, or similar model in uh, the applied element me me method, whereas, whether it's in uh, like a Britain material. Uh, so this here is the concrete model, for example, that we are using in this specific uh, research. And the modeling is, of course, it's different in tension than in compression. And you can model the shear uh, failure. So uh, what you have here is the springs. Uh, if they are, if the, if the stress, the shear stress exceeds the uh, shear strength, the springs fail. But it also takes into consideration, of course, whether the spring is in tension or in uh, compression. So if the spring is in compression, you have additional shear resistance. While if the spring is in tension, uh, it, uh, it, the shear strength reduces significantly up to cracking when the spring is cracked, then you don't have any uh, shear strength. Okay, so uh, this is a quick verification that we ju just did to show the modeling of uh, different uh, components. This is just a static experiment. This is how we model the reinforcement bars, the concrete uh, elements, and we just try to model the FRP sheets using uh, a layer uh, of elements, also applied elements, and we're just showing that the prediction for the uh, force deformation uh, is acceptable and uh, we are able to reproduce the delamination that is observed in uh, modeling of, uh, in, in, in the actual experiment. This is the AEM model that we built for this experiment. Uh, as Tarek mentioned, uh, th this experiment uh, had uh, had been done and at the top here, for example, the boundary conditions, they had a top uh, a beam at the, uh, at the front and at the back, and there was a small gap in here. We all modeled all those details in the model because we found, for example, that the, the width of this gap at the back really affected the, uh, the overall behavior. So it's not a pure hinge uh, condition. Uh, we modeled the reinforcement exactly as Tarek shown uh, has shown earlier, uh, so I'll leave it up to Tarek to speak about the single uh, degree of freedom. For the single degree of freedom approaches, we used two of them as beds, as Marlon presented a, um, in the previous uh, uh, presentation. And uh, the second one is RC Blast, uh, and actually that's going to be the following presentation. Uh, both of them, they capture uh, a, a, an actual uh, resistance function based on uh, hysteretic response. Uh, they allow for uh, plastic hinges, um, but RC Blast has the advantage of actually controlling the size of it, and uh, depending on that, uh, it has a different resistance function. Uh, also, um, the the uh, response is again sing singular freedom, so it's more um, approximate. Uh, this is like a, a comparison, quick comparison between the different cases. Uh, using RC blast um, uh, predictions, and the major thing you notice here is the mass is always the same. What differs the most is going to be the resistance function, and the thicker the the, uh, the FRP, the stronger the, uh, the the higher the resistance, um, and also uh, the elastic um, um, uh, yield uh, displacement, or um, another measure of how much ductile the system is, uh, varies. So if the thinner the layer, the more ductile it is. Um, the typical response limits uh, for regular concrete is mainly based on the end rotations. However, for the FRP1, it's actually defined as Marlon uh, presented on the actual ductility because you're, not, you're never going to be able to reach that level of end rotations with a stiff um, uh, retrofit like FRP. Uh, predictive blast responses. Uh, this is the, the combined case for the regular um, concrete without FRP. Uh, you see SDOF and ELS um, that came really close to the uh, testing. 
uh, SPEDS um, has an, an overshoot of probably close to 100%. Um, and the reason being in my um, estimation is the actual stiffness, it uh, shows a stiffer uh, response. And based on that, that stiffer response uh, creates um, more energy uh, absorbed by the structure and therefore higher response. Uh, for the ALS, um, so, 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 these, yeah. so these are the results for the ELS model for the first control case, and we've uh, used a principal strain to uh, represent the cracking. We found it gives a good indication of the cracking. So this is the back face of the specimen, and this is the front face of the specimen. This is the comparison of the failure mode predicted for this uh, specific case to the control case. And uh, we've observed that uh, the extent of plasticity uh, differs from one specimen to the other. So how far those uh, those here are the steel bars embedded within the concrete, how far those uh, steel bars yield, uh, this length differs from one specimen to, to the other. Uh, another point I wanted to point out is at higher, like at any load step actually, whenever you have open uh, cracks, those cracks have no tensile or shear resistance. So the shear is, is resisted by only, for example, at this time instant, the area with the the area which is of the cross section which is shown in red, that's the part that is resisting uh, shear. Uh, this here is a video for the retrofitted case. Yeah, now it's done. Okay. So so this is how the uh, displacement. This is the displacement with uh, time for that specific uh, specimen, and this is the deformation. And you can see the boundary condition at, at the top and the bottom. They're not perfectly hinged. There is a gap, and it allows for a bit of rotation. And then towards the end, there is a little bit of uh, inter interaction. It's, it's semi-fixed. Uh, I think the next slide. Sorry. So uh, these are the uh, peak responses for the second case, which is the one with the CFRP. And as you can see here, uh, there is a discrepancy between the different methodologies. Uh, the one that the thing that you notice is S beds using flexure or assuming that the flexure resistance is fully engaged uh, always predicts a much higher uh, displacement response. Uh, you also notice that with, uh, I'm sorry, much lower uh, dis uh, displacement response, which is the magenta one at the bottom. The one assuming that there is a shear failure, which happens to be in all cases of CFRP retrofit that we have, so cases two to five. All of them um, shown higher uh, uh, shear stresses that actually indicates that there's going to be a shear failure at the support. So it will, therefore, it will show that top top curve there that shows that the estimate is about three inches compared to a non-retrofitted of four inches. So it didn't get enough of effectiveness of your CFRP because of your lack in shear capacity. Um, the uh, the actual response for RC slab and ELS kind of lies in between. So the conclusion here is, if you consider s base your, your model um, uh, base, then uh, the shear uh, based uh, s bits simulation will always give you a higher, uh, an upper bound of the response, while the flexure one is going to give you the lower bound. For the first uh, retrofitted case, it's case two, this is uh, one layer of uh, uh, FRP and for ca carbon, carbon fiber, and we see the what Tarot just mentioned, it's, uh, it's in between, it's not purely uh, flexure, it's not purely shear, it's a combined uh, failure mode, but uh, th there is a shear component to that failure. Right. Case three is the one with both faces, and apparently it didn't show any dif different response. It's about very similar to uh, the one with the back face only. Um, and the reason is the one that was not, uh, the response was always in the uh, one direction. It did not rebound back. Uh, in the in the, uh, the northward bound back in the uh, outbound uh, case four with the thicker one you see all of them are combined in, in a narrow band here at the bottom and uh, it shows like there is some agreement for some sort that uh, the, with a higher flexure capacity uh, they're all predicting very similar responses however in my uh, understanding is this is the case that's going to have the worst shear demand and therefore I tend to believe the top one, which shows that it's shared controlled response and it should show more. So essentially, if you provide more or a thicker FRP than you need, you're actually hurting your structure, not helping. Uh, case five with the GFRP, very similar um, in sense. It's just a weaker uh, FRP doesn't mean it doesn't work. It still works and it actually gives probably the same, uh, within the same range of protection level uh, with different uh, value for the response. Yeah, gonna have to skip, gonna yeah, skip that. That. Uh, to the conclusions. 
uh, these are just combined cases for, for all the cases for different um, uh, methods, so we already covered that. Um, uh, for the conclusions, mainly uh, FRP can improve your response if, if, these, if well designed. Uh, the issues that you need to be uh, aware of is the reduced ductility and the increased demand on shear, and you have to be uh, careful about how you approach that. Uh, the other thing is uh, not everybody, not anyone, can perform that kind of analysis. You have to be really uh, have a good background in both blast and both structural design to be able to really uh, design it and detail it. Um, so the effectiveness are always, in my opinion, for the cases that we investigated, <coughs> limited by the shear capacity. So if you have no mean of strengthening your existing element uh, for shear, then you have to be really um, careful about how much of an FRP retrofit you want to go for. Maybe you even consider other uh, alternative uh, retrofitting techniques. Um, the, uh, the use of stronger CFRP laminates uh, give you higher blast resistance, but again, it, it also have higher shear demand. Uh, the modeling from the, like, from the conclusion from the modeling part using the applied element method is uh, we were able to uh, simulate the dynamic behavior and the mode of failure. And uh, in some cases, we observed the debonding of the uh, FRP sheets from the concrete. And we've noticed that this allows us to uh, make a better estimate for the limit of uh, plasticity. Uh, you don't need to make a st an initial estimate for the length of the plastic hinge to, to start your analysis. And also the uh, discussion about like what's the responding mass to the blast. Also, that is, is not required. The, the method takes care. Uh, of it and uh, another point that we think should be uh, taken into consideration is uh, comparing uh, the models to a, a, a group of uh, tests actual uh, experimental tests to uh, fine-tune the parameters for the the shear uh, failure so there the parameters for the shear failure need to be uh, input correctly in order to get uh, reliable uh, results. So uh, in, in this case, for example, we, we use the control case to uh, control like the, the, the input for uh, the, sh the, shear, uh, the shear parameters in the, in the material model. And this is, this is the same with any material model that you would uh, use. Um, this concludes uh, our presentation. And uh, there's a time for questions.